So last week, we talked about a mannequin head that someone programmed to work with Amazon's home assistant. A viewer wrote in on Twitter that this would be a great way to stay connected to your family after they've passed on. And that's not creepy. Mm. Our guest today wrote about this growing field of death technology, and she's joining us to talk about it. Welcome, Adrian Mate, a contributor at Quartz. So tell us a bit, little bit about how these chatbots that are crafted from our digital data, uh, how will we use them to bring back the dead? So, so far, this technology is kind of in a preliminary state. There has only been one person who's been brought back from the dead, so to speak. Um, which is this man, Roman Mazarenko, by uh, his best friend, Eugenia Cunha, who runs um, an AI company called Luca. So what she has done is gathered all of the data that Roman produced during his lifetime, all of the texts, the emails, the personal messages, and fed them through this artificial neural network, which is able to rearrange his sentence structure, his patterns of speech, and kind of predict how he might answer questions. Wow. So for some of us, I think what we post on Facebook or Snapchat or Twitter isn't isn't really the real us. That was my first concern with that. It's sort of what we, you know, it's, it's a different uh, form of us. But the idea of using this later to, you know, that that would be what stuck around, I guess that is what's going to be st sticking around now. But um, do you see any any issues with people using that uh, as the, the way to create a person? Yeah, well, you know, it's never really going to be the real us. Um, the way that Eugenia actually described it, I thought was quite accurate. She said it's sort of like talking to a shadow of a person or almost talking to a therapist. And I do think that there are some complications that we run into when we think of like the version of ourselves we present on Twitter or on Facebook, not necessarily being an accurate representation of who we are. So I think the more, um, the more data that is fed into these systems, the more accurate it is going to be. Say if you wrote a book or if you have a lot of emails, um, personal messages might be a little bit more authentic. Also, there are some new programs that are being developed that are just bots that kind of work to encourage you to open up in a way that you would only do privately and may not uh, on social media to try to just document a better sense of who you really are. So all of that is there saved somewhere in case your loved ones do want to do something with it when you die, but isn't necessarily made public during your lifetime. So you're collecting all this information, uh, which I mean is you know really how these AI systems work. The more you feed it, the more accurate it gets around, you know, uh, constructing at least in this case constructing the persona of the person that you're chatting with. How convincing did it end up being? I mean, is this one of those cases where it's like, yeah, hey, yeah, you're still kind of chatting with a robot, or would it would it be capable of of tricking even someone that knows them quite well? Yeah, that's the Turing test question. I think that we're looking at these becoming much more authentic representations in the future. Um, somebody that I was interviewing was saying that, you know, within the next decade, this technology is going to be a lot more convincing as it is right now. You know, it's still pretty good. Eugenia said that Roman's mother was quite impressed with the technology. So if a, a man's mother is going, wow, I'm still learning things about my son after he died through this piece of tech, I mean, that was something that kind of made me perk up and listen. And and is that more a case of this chatbot is good at having the right kind of like uh, cadence or, you know, or you know what I mean? Or, or kind of like talk, talking in the or chatting in the same type of sentence structure that they used to? Or is it about actually understanding and knowing the history of that person to be able to kind of convey very personal elements back at them? Yeah, I think that that um, the neural networks are advancing to become a little bit better at really faking being a person. But as they are now, they, they have a sense of humor. They can be self-deprecating. They, you know, can crack jokes. So they're not just really awkward, basic bots. They're pretty sophisticated, you know. Yeah. You know, it kind of makes me think if sometimes you have a friendship where you only text every once in a while and you go for months or years kind of keeping in touch on a bit of a superficial level, you could really, you know, have someone in your life for a long time after they passed away. That's a really good point. <laughs> Not even know, yeah. maybe. <laughs> so your piece in Quartz is really about like the psychology of bringing people back from the dead, which is, you know, is something that we, we might not be so far away from uh, with all of the new technology that we have. But do you see, as you looked into these uh, chatbots, do you see that people 
did psychologists think that people would use this more as a crutch to avoid grieving or was it something that people could really use to get through the grieving process? Well, the grief counselor I spoke to made the really good point that uh, emotional support isn't something we want to be outsourcing to bots. Uh, our Western society has a bit of uncertainty around how to talk about death to begin with and kind of distancing ourselves from our ability to connect with the bereaved is it's, it's just not good for humans. Um, so I think that you know, worst case scenario, these could be used as a crutch uh, or a way to isolate yourself when you're grieving. Um, there's a lot of emotional responsibility kind of wrapped up with this piece of technology, but a kind of alternate perspective on it is that uh, here's this piece of tech that's getting us talking about the dead and about grieving and about the things that we still want to say to people and about what was left unresolved and still feels really important to us. And those are all like messy, sensitive subjects that rarely, you know, come up in polite conversation. People tiptoe around them. So if this kind of technology can get people opening up about, you know, someone they still care about just because they're dead doesn't really mean that they're gone. And I think this kind of reinforces that sentiment. Yeah, I mean, you uh, talk about, I mean, you think about people are often, they don't prepare for, you hear about people who don't prepare, they don't they don't have any plan, uh, they, they don't want to talk about what, what it's going to be like when they're dead because they don't want to think about it at all and they leave their family uh, in, you know, a, 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 it's unfortunate for their family often. And you, Facebook, of course, lets you turn your Facebook over uh, to someone in, in the event of your death and people don't always do that because they don't want to think about it. When I say people, I mean me. I don't want to think about it. I haven't done that. <laughs> but so what you, when you talked before about these uh, ch these kinds of uh, ways you could uh, have the chatbot and feed the chatbot information instead of it just taking your crazy Snapchats, you could be feeding it information that you'd want people to remember. So I guess uh, what you're saying is we can really start thinking about how we want to be remembered as opposed to, um, you know, and, and start talking about it with our family. Yeah, you know, some people do prepare a little bit by doing things like making a scrapbook um, or writing letters to their children to read after they've passed away. And this could be seen as a little bit more of a high-tech extension of that kind of a practice. Yeah, I think uh, one question that I have, and I, I don't know if you have the answer to this because it really sounds like this is just kind of evolving and kind of the ethics around it are kind of evolving right now, is the question of who decides when this happens, right? Is this is this a decision that a person makes before they pass away and they say, all right, these pieces of information are okay to go to so-and-so so that when I'm gone, this digital likely, likeliness of me can be created in a chatbot? Or is this something that like a, a grieving spouse says, well, I've been given access to this when my spouse passed away and I'd really like to revisit him or her so here you go. And does that kind of cross a line where someone that says, you know, well, they can't speak because they're dead, but maybe someone you know, would, would, if they were alive, choose not to do that when, in fact, it ends up happening uh, once they pass away? Yeah, that's a good point. And I think it's too early to say how this is going to work in practice if it becomes a little bit more mainstream. But privacy is such a big issue surrounding it. I mean, you don't want you don't want the wrong people to start learning the wrong tidbits about you after you die. I mean, mm -hmm. it just seems like the plot to a yeah. bad horror film. Sure. Yeah, I was thinking it sounds like the plot to Bridges of Madison County when they find their mom's diary and then they relive her life. So I think we, someone needs to do an update to that. <laughs> Adrian, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're a contributor to Quartz. Uh, where, where, where else can people find your work? Um, I work at Nouveau Magazine, which is a Canadian lifestyle publication, and I also have work published on adrianmatei.com. All right. Thank you so much Thank for joining us. Thank you so us. much, Adrian. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Have a good night.